Good evening. Uh, welcome to the fifth in the Legends and Fly Tying series. My name is Fred Dupre, and I'll be your host tonight and for the next four sessions in December. You can get our future dates on the FFI website under FFI Online Season 2. While you're on our website, it would be a great time to either renew your membership or to join the FFI and the Fly Tying Group. Your dues to the FFI support the many excellent programs like this one. The prime benefit to this series is our Q&A sessions with the tires. If you wanna ask questions tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your page. You might wanna also get your cell phone ready to take pictures uh, of fly pattern recipes and cross-reference feather to hair charts that Jim will provide you. Tonight, we're featuring Jim Ferguson. Jim is a refocused, retired physical science educator, spending lots of enjoyable hours tying flies and demoing tying when possible. He has received the Oregon Tire of the Year Award from the Oregon Council, the Dick Nelson Teaching Award, and the Buzz Busick Award for, from the FFI and has earned the bronze, silver, and gold awards through the F Fly Tying Group uh, Awards Program. His demo tying includes FFI, Oregon, Washington, Northern Idaho, Boise, Idaho, Turtle Bay Museum, Eastern Idaho, and International Atlantic Tying Events. He also teaches fly tying classes. Well, good evening. Let me get Jim uh, switched over here. Hold on a second. Okay. Now oh, we got <laughs> okay, good. Welcome, Jim. What are you going to tie for us tonight? Well, Tonight, I'm going to just partially tie uh, a hair wing replacement pattern. It's the, uh, the Dusty Miller is one of the oldest Atlantic's full dressed uh, Atlantic salmon classic pattern, which uses normally would use um, swan or goose in the wing. And it has an underwing of uh, white tip turkey and it would, it would uh, use feathers. But there's several reasons why we sometimes want to switch from using feathers to using hair, uh, some other method uh, to construct that wing. Cost is one. Uh, to do the wings, the swan and the, and the good goose and, and large turkey for the larger flies is difficult to come by. In a lot of shops, uh, they carry usually goose, but very rarely carry the swan or the very large turkey that's been dyed many different colors. But you can get replacement hair like bucktail fairly easily. And so a lot of the classic patterns were converted to hair wing patterns oh, ever since the early and late 1800s because over here in the United States, we didn't have those feathers coming in from Africa and you know through the British system. But we did have bear, we did have deer, and we did have raccoon, and we did have possum and a couple other uh, hairy critters that we could use that 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 fiber instead of the uh, more expensive and hard to get feather that's called for in the recipe. So what I've got is a, uh, I'll give you a quick picture of the. This is where you might want to get your cell phone out to take a picture of this chart. Yeah, this first one, this is the hair wing conversion pattern. And uh, the body, the tail, the body and the, and the hair hackle right here and the throat is normal. But in here, rather than making use of the uh, 
feathers, I, I've done some conversion using different hair material. And you end up with a fairly low set wing that way, and it works well in the water and quite often imitates when the water starts coming down on this thing and compresses, you get end up with a, a bait fish type of pattern. So what I've done is made a list of different patterns. Now, is that shared? Not yet. You hit share screen and then the document that you want. Here, we, we're getting there. Yeah. Okay, I want to make it full size here. There. Now that's a picture of the particular fly that I showed you in the vise. And you might want to take a picture of that. You've got the, uh, the tip and tag, tail, butt, body, rib, hackle. And that's all pretty much, and, and the throat, those are pretty much the same as for the standard uh, pattern. What is different is in the wing. Uh, you've got a gray squirrel underwing, which takes place of a white-tipped turkey. You've got yellow, scarlet, and orange dyed. Now it says manga ringtail there, and it's kind of like a raccoon type of critter, the manga ringtail. But uh, I've used bucktail. And then you've got red squirrel tail over, which would take place of something like the bronze mallard. And then uh, you've got the sides of gray fox. That's the, the, uh, the white right to the left of the sticking out past the jungle cock. And that takes place of uh, the barred wood duck. And then you've got uh, the jungle cock. That is not a, <laughs> that, that's a real uh, feather there. I kept those the same. There's, uh, you can't find a imitation of jungle cock. Now over the top, I, I still kept the uh, golden pheasant crest, which is a feather. And you, it's hard to see them, but, but there's two horns on there in blue. Jim, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, I've seen some tires use cut out a guinea feather for a jungle cock eye. You ever seen yeah. that? Yes, I have, except that's still a feather. That's correct. <laughs> that's right. Another thing they will use is starling. You go to a starling and they'll have uh, some feathers with just a whitish dot on it. And some people will even dye those orange and they'll come up with some pretty good replacements. Um, but so what I end up with is a combination of feathers and um, hair wing hair material for that replacement. Now, what I also have. This is another one that you might want to get your camera out. This is an interesting chart. Um, now, is that shared yet? What's that? Not is yet. Your not chart's yet. not on yet. Hit the share screen and then the, the document. Yeah, this chart that he's trying to pull up right now shows the cross reference between the feather and the hair substitute. Um, here it is, right here. This is a great chart. Yeah. Now this one um, are the different types of materials that uh, are called for in the Atlantic salmon recipe, dyed swan and goose. Uh, replacements, it says dyed polar bear or bucktail. 
I would be very careful with the dyed polar bear because it's on the endangered species list. Supposedly, if the critter was killed before the CETA Act, it's okay to use, but your best bet is to um, steer clear. Stay clear of it, yeah. <laughs> uh, brown mallard, you get brown bucktail, brown turkey, you get brown squirrel tail, pintail and teal, the gray squirrel, not stacked, will replace some of that because you'll get some of the grayish and whitish colors in there that you get with pintail and teal. Now these are from uh, Bates's book, Atlantic Salmon Flies and Fishing. The ISBN numbers up there. The Stuart Nallen wrote a book on flies for Atlantic salmon and you got the ISBN and the, and the soft cover in here. He's got a section where you've got the hair, you've got the feather wing, and then right on the opposite opposing page, you've got a picture of the feather re, or the uh, hair wing replacement pattern. So you can see how they are are changing the uh, the pattern, and his list goes through and you've got it there, the white tip turkey and then you've got Bob Warren's list because the, although Stuart and Allen wrote the book, Bob Warren is the one who, who uh, did most of the conversions. So you got quite a few feathers there that can be replaced using the different uh, hairs. And then on the others down below, you know, I put uh, swan and goose and dyed turkey. All oh, I usually use the dyed bucktail. And then on the Amherst pheasant, uh, that's one that was not listed. And I kind of tend to use a lighter portions of badger or raccoon. You just want to make sure you don't stack them too much because you, then you'll just go into two colors instead of maybe some of the barring that's there. So those are the uh, different replacements for feathers that can be used in the wings of these Atlantic salmon patterns. There's one section down here where I talked about upper portion of tail down here on the other for the dyed bucktail. And what I wanted to do was to uh, You trying to get your fly back on? Yeah. Okay. While you're doing that, uh, someone asked a question: Is uh, the hook size of your fly? Yeah, a lot of Atlantic salmon flies are tied uh, using uh, well, one odd, two odd are kind of small. You can go even smaller, but uh, usually three odd, four odd, five odd are common sizes for some of these classics. Now for display, the sum will even go even larger than that. And in that case, you run into some problems finding the right length of stuff. Now, a lot of the hair replacements that I tie, I tie for use as steelhead patterns. And so you've got uh, Alec Jackson's one and a half, Daiichi, and then you've also got the Daiichi 2055, which is, is uh, Bob Vervirka. I might have mispronounced that name, but his hook does not drop off as much. For instance. Jim, if you can get the picture back to your fly or to yourself, yeah. that would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, it would be. I want to, there. there you go. Okay, now let me go to. There. There you go. Uh, Alec Jackson hooks tend to really drop off as you, quickly as you go back. And you have a uh, fairly not as severe as this one. This is a partridge hook here. Um, this is an example of a Bob for Bob's hook. 
Notice that the eye of the hook does not have as steep of incline and it's fairly straight shanked all the way back to the point above the barb. Whereas Alec Jackson's hooks are, are um, more of a space style and they uh, start dropping off well in front of, of that point. Now, what I wanted to do was switch back momentarily here to me. And for instance, when I mentioned different parts of the of the deer tail. Now here's a deer tail. And this part down here, you know, if you just it it is pretty hollow. And so it flares a lot. Now when you turn it over, you'll see this going clear up to here for the length of the tail. And what I usually do is think of this as being divided into thirds. And so at this point right in here, simply break it. And this part can be used for uh, woolly buggers and stuff you want flaring. Here is the tail where you've got less hollow fibers. And so they will not flare as much. And as you go up even further, you can break this and you get the very tip. And these fibers here don't flare at all, hardly. You pinch that and they just stay straight. The result is, is that you, you switch from a fly that has, or a material that has, like down here at the, uh, you can see how this flares up. This is from the middle section. And this hold, that up. Very, hey, hold that up a little higher, there you go. This is from the mid middle section and this is from the very tip section. And you can see that you can control those fibers better so that they can replace and lay on top of each other and stack just like you would if you were marrying some feathers. So with that, I was gonna to start to show you, uh, you know, how this is done. Um, let me switch back to the camera that has the fly. This vise is one that has two heads. It can really hold that fly in there with minimum. <laughs> that's a uh, Contarelli vise, correct? Yeah, that's right. And uh, now this is one where you have, you have a couple options. This one, I put a white tip turkey on for the underwing. And you, you could start from there. Now, when I tie the, the fly up to the winging portion, you've got a body hackle. And what I've done is I just take an index card, fold it over and some clips. And what that does is it'll, it keeps those fibers down and helps to form them so that they stay nice and, you know, like below the top of that shank. Now I'm gonna put this into the... So it keeps those uh, throat fibers folded down, right? Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's the body hackle. Oh, okay, that's all right, I can see it now. Yeah, and you know, it's a light colored, but it's, it's there, you know. Can't see it there, okay. <laughs> now, you have options when tying some of these, you know, you do the underwing, then the overwing, and then the throat. 
or some people will do an underwing and then they'll do the throat and then they'll do the overwing. And usually what I do is I use white thread up until this point and then I'll switch over to black thread And the reason that you have all these parts of the fly like a throat in the, in the order in which people tie things on has a lot to do with what you want to hide. You know, you, you make mistakes or you leave open spaces or you've got spots that just don't, you, you can see right to the shank. Well, you cover those up and you can cover them up with the throat. So if you put the underwing on, it's going to be on top, but it's going to leave a space on the bottom. But if you then put your throat on, that's going to cover that open spot down below here. So you want to leave enough space up here on the front so that you can add material and stagger it. Now, for the... Um, Underwing, what we're going to use there is gray squirrel. This is gray squirrel tail, correct? Correct. Now, white tip turkey has a white tip and a black body. So when you look at at this, you can see the white tip up here. And you can see sort of a black. Now it does have some mottled uh, brown in there. But if I take, take that sample, and here's where you want to remember, don't overdo in the amount of hair that you're going to be using. Hair builds bulk. And you take out as much of the under fur as you can, and then stack it. Now, it's nice if you have a large stacker. One thing, don't hit the table, pound on the table, unless you got a real solid one. The vibrations will make this thing loosen up and all of a sudden you got a problem. Okay, so I, there they're stacked. I take them out. And probably I want to thin this out a little bit. And then you kind of, the, the, the white tip, you want to kind of fill this space back here. So you want to figure out, okay, there's the tie-in spot. I'm going to put my finger, other hand fingers there. Now I use a system of pre-gluing and pre-cutting. I have found that when I use that system, the hairs compress better and do not leave a large bump. So I'll put a fair amount of glue on this front portion here, both sides. And I'll even put a little drop where I'm going to tie this in. Now, what I've done is I've made my own um, bodkins. That is one of those insect mounting pins and you can get them in different sizes. And it really allows you to use small amounts of glue. Here's one that's even much smaller. Now the pre-cutting part you want to make sure that you use serrated scissors when you do your pre-cutting. So what all I'm going to do is cut this. And 
Now you'll notice that I've got the long finger and the thumb holding on to these fibers. When you look at it, they're held fairly rigidly both sides. If I use these two fingers, see the angle at which you're in things that are down here would be loose held, things up here would be tight held. So you want to make sure that you hold on to these fibers until they're well secured. So I should have the right length mounted down. And I go up with a soft loop, one, two. Now, when you tighten up, you'll see all sorts of directions. Some people will say, well, pull down. If you've made two loops, you're going to be OK. But if you've only made one loop, you should pull up because now those fibers are being held. And you can go down and back up, take it off your hands away, and there it is mounted. Now, what you'll notice is, is there is a little bit of a drop off here, but not as severe as would occur if I had tied that in without pre-cutting. Then if I cut, I would definitely have come out here and boom, down to the shank. So this is a way to minimize that effect of having bulk at the, at the back. When you tie Atlantics with the feathers, usually you put everything on and then you cut all the stems off at the end. And Jim, there was, Jim, there was a question. Yeah. What type, what type of glue are you using or cement? I'm using Sally Hansen's Extreme, like most of uh, a lot of us have converted over to. Salir is another form. Uh, it's a French, uh, gotten a little more expensive uh, since it has to be, can't, can't be shipped by air. It's so volatile that uh, it's hazardous. You can also get pretty high on it just sitting around in it or buy it. Um, and the, the uh, solvent for Salir is heptane, which is what is used to cut um, rubber cement. And heptane, if you open a can of heptane, it just starts evaporating right away and it's extremely flammable. Sally Hansen's, uh, I need to find out from the company or try some different things to see what can be used to uh, thin it down because every once in a while, you know, it, it does thicken up, but it's much cheaper. Rather than eight or nine dollars a bottle for the Salir, you can get, it uh, used to be two or three dollars for the Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails. It's gone up a little bit in the, pa in the uh, recent, but uh, that, see, you want something thin because you want it to penetrate into the hairs and in between the hairs so that when you tie them down, they are well held <laughs> in place. Uh, Jim? Yeah. Uh, I've, I've used it, successfully used acetone with Sally Hansen's. So okay. I'll try that. I'll try that and see, because that, that, that would be a good one. Okay. Okay, now to start putting in the hair, or the wing material. The uh, over wing starts with there it is. What's the next material you'll be putting on, Jim? It's deer. Deer hair. Deer, deer hair. tail. It's the, and, and the order is yellow, scarlet, and orange. So this is the upper portion of that deer tail. And all I'm going to do is take some of these fibers in here. Now you don't, you got two options. You can take a bunch, not a whole lot. Use your serrated scissors. Use serrated because if you don't, the fibers tend to slip and you really cut at angles. 
Now you'll notice up here there aren't too there, there's not much in there as far as any underfur. And you've got options at this point. You can either use, and I'm going to shorten this because I don't need them that long. You can either when you did a feather wing, or when you do a feather wing, you would you would construct your wing by having like these three fingers, the bottom one being yellow uh, swan, then red swan, and then orange swan and marry them together. And there'd be about three fibers in each, three or four fibers in each. And then you would have it on this side the same way so that you would have the right and the left side of the wing going up over the underwing. We're going to try to mimic that. And what I'm going to do is to take that yellow deer and stack it. And this is going to be one side of the overwing. I'm going to start with the far side, and it's going to go on the side like that. So you want it to go to the tail in terms of the length. So you locate where you're going to tie in and you go through the same process of free gluing Jim, as you're doing that, I notice you're pre-gluing before you cut. Uh, yes. Is there a reason for that? Well, you could cut it first if you want, but I find that the gluing starts make making it starts to make those fibers stick together. Oh, okay. And then when you cut. Those fibers stay together. Because if I let go of this thing now, those fibers just splay. I got you. So I kind of turn it to the side here where I'm going to mount it. Go up and over with the soft loop, the second soft loop in front and tighten it up. And see, I've mounted it a little bit low, but it's on the side. Now I'm going to come back up with the thread and then I'm going to do identically the same thing on the other side. Now with, I'm using deer hair, but if I was using feathers, I'd have to make sure that I had hair from the right and the left because of the way that the feathers tend to bend. Now deer hair does the same thing, curves this, curves, you know, this way on this side and that way on that one. And you can go ahead and take it from different sides. But you don't want to overdo in the amount of hair that you're going to, going to use. So you want to batch. It's, I need to stack it first. This is where a large opening helps on your stacker. Now, some people who are good at hand stacking, you know, you can also do that. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, use the 
stack or you can adjust them by hand. Okay, and again, it's gonna go on this side. You want the hair to come back to the tip of it towards the tail. So there's my get your tie in spot. And then again, pre glue, pre cut. So there's a fair amount of glob of glue there, but. I can see that if you uh, start putting too many fibers on there, the thing will get way too bulky. Oh, you get a huge head. Right. Now there's tricks to get around that a little bit. Well, not only the head, but the, I think the, the, the body of the, the wing of the fly would get too bulky. Yeah, you've got all sorts of explanations as to the size of that head. A lot of people think, oh, you now you go over easy the first and tighten down. Now see, you got yellow on either side of that. I'm a little down a little far there, but I'm not gonna correct it now. Uh, and then the next, well, some people say you need to have a real small head on a fly. And other people will say that when you have a larger head, as in that case, that it kind of pushes the water and helps cause some sound vibrations. I don't know if that is true or if it's baloney or what, but um, it could be just people that can't make a small head on a fly given a reason for it. James, Sometimes how many more uh, pieces of uh, uh, material types are we putting on the fly? Okay, well, what I'm going to do to, uh, uh, to speed things up a little bit, normally I would put on a red deer. It's, it's red bucktail? Red bucktail. Okay. Now, since you'll notice that there isn't, I'm, I'm pretty well at the top, I don't have to put this on the side. So what I can do now is take the red cut it Stack it. Jim, there's a question of uh, on your bo bobbin, you've got a black bobbin grip move towards the end of the bobbin. Is that, someone's asking the reason for that. It makes it a little rounder to hold. <laughs> okay. That's the way the company made it. And what's the name of the bobbin? Right bobbin. Oh, it's a right bobbin. Okay. R-I-T-E. Right. Okay. So there would be the red going up on top. And when I said there are ways of getting around some of this, uh, bulkiness. One is to stagger, where you could, instead of, now in this case, I cut it first and then I <laughs> show in both ways of doing it. Okay. I could stagger it forward, but I'm not going to. I'm going to tie it in here. Soft loop, 
second soft loop and then start tying it down. And there's the red section. And then the last section is going to be an orange section on top of that. So each one of these sections are uh, imitating the married wings of the feathered version, correct? Correct. Now, this, I'm going to hand the same process you're gluing. Uh, feathers together, measuring the length, and then cutting the length, right? Yeah. And cutting, pre-cutting is important because otherwise you would really have a much bigger head build up. Okay, and now you have the three colors that would be in a um, for the, for the overwing. Okay, now it calls for a uh, throat of speckled guinea, and this is guinea. And guinea, and you can see the uh, spots on it. Speckled guinea you can see that in even though it's got dots on it, there's some much finer. It's even almost hard to really see little speckles of, of white. And you've got a couple different ways of tying these things on. One is to wrap it on as a collar. And the other way would be to do like Poole Jorgensen used to do. He would Just take a section like that, pull this forward. Now you, you would have to make sure you get a center feather so that they would, and then you would come in and tie it on and pull this forward and it would put a nice tight throat. Hold, you got to hold on to the bobbin while you do that, and you would put a nice tight throat on there. Now, notice I went way forward on that. See, I covered up that spot. I don't have much head space when I do it that way, though. And you can come back. And now I got enough headspace again, and you've got your throat on there. The advantage of doing it that way is that when you cut this off, trim it off, I didn't cut any stem, I just cut fibers. So well, at least, at least it minimizes buildup. The what? Leaves very little bulk. Yeah. Cuts your bulk down considerably. Yep. Now, sometimes, you know, people will tie on with four or five wraps, and then before they put this other stuff on, they'll back off. 
that's one way of minimizing headspace. You know, you, you put five wraps on, well, if you back off three wraps, then you got two wraps holding the material and then put the next material on. And, but um, in, th in this case, I'm more or less not doing one for the show plate. I'm doing one for fishing. <laughs> Okay, so now that takes care of the throat and the uh, wing, uh, main parts of the wing. Now, to imitate the bronze mallard, we have this red squirrel. Now, how does that look like bronze mallard? Well, if I turn this over, see that nice brown color? And there's a little bit of the grayish tones and that you get with the bronze mallard. So what I'm going to do is take just a little bit of that. And bronze mallard does not usually go the whole way, but I want to make sure that I keep more of the brown colors than the gray. So thin it out. And make sure that you uh, one of these little comb gadgets sometimes works in terms of getting rid of some of the under fur that's there. Again, you don't need much. And you can stack it or you can just peel off the short hairs. Another thing is, is like on today where it's cold, I've got a sheet here of static cling, you know, to remove <laughs> static electricity so that the hairs, because every time you stroke these fibers, you pull electrons off and you end up having it start to, fibers start to flare on you. So that's one, I think Hal, Al and Gretchen, I think they commented that you can, even with some of the sprays, you can spray some of the, the uh, hair fibers with, with a spray that reduces static cling. So you're just using a dryer sheet? Yeah, that's all I did was use a, a cling-free dryer sheet. I hate the smell of them. You, uh, I right. Buy ones that uh, don't have the odor because, oh, the strong odor. So there's the bronze mallard on top of it. or at least the hair replacement for bronze mallard. Now, for the, uh, okay, here's your barred wood duck. And, and normally the pattern would call for a slip of that in there for the side. Here is the replacement for barred wood duck, gray fox. And you can, sometimes badger will work, but usually badger is a little bit longer than you need. And you just cut a section here. And this has a lot of soft under fur that you want to get rid of. You just want the guard hairs. And then this you need to stack. And I usually use a slightly smaller stacker for that. And you want to make sure you get all those fuzzy ones out, otherwise it won't stack very well.
But when it does stack, there you've got the black bar at the top, you've got a white bar in the middle, and then black below it. And then again, you want to pre-measure And I pre-glue pre-cut. and put it in where that cheek would be or a side. Jim, for tonight, can we just do one side of the fly? I was just going to consider doing that and I'll just okay. show you how to finish this off. Because over that, you would put a jungle cock and so do you pre-sort your jungle cock and put them in little bags i have done that so that it speeds things up. Yep. And also, you don't have to take your, but you do have a right and a left to these things. You can see how this, the, this one, let me get it out of the bag. See how it kind of kind of uh, bends like over there like that? Correct. And the other one bent the other way, but okay. it would go on the other side. So this one would, would fit right over this one. This one is a little bit big. Now you'll notice that when I didn't strip those off, those fibers, what I do is I, I pull them back and then I will cut along the stem and it leaves the fibers sticking out so that it helps hold it flat. Now, sometimes you would also maybe with a, a pair of, of uh, forceps that are smooth jawed forceps flatten that stem but sometimes you can get it to lay on there without holding it up and over. And there it is. Now, I would probably use a much smaller jungle cock, but I'm going to keep that the way it is. Now, the uh, next step would be to put a um, crest over the top of it. And crests This is a uh, golden pheasant crest? Golden pheasant crest. And I had some already done again. <laughs> You can't see me frantically looking here, <laughs> but. Well, I've seen your materials and how you've sorted those pheasant crests out by size. Yep. yep. <laughs> That's the box I'm looking in. <laughs> yep. Okay. And, and I've watched you right do here. the same now thing. Notice that the tip of this is has a little reddish spot. 
and that's what you want. Ideally, you want one to sit on here and the tips come together. Now, this one is a little bit long, but what I can do is come in here roughly where, and again, I don't, whenever you do this part of it, you lose some of the side uh, Porsche veilings. But I haven't stripped them off. What I'm going to do again is to trim these. Sometimes you cut the stem and then you say a few words, but. Uh, so this feather comes from the, the crest, the crest. Of a golden pheasant yeah. head on top of his head. Yep. Like that. <laughs> yep, there you go. Now, when you choose one at the store, what you hope to get is a head that kind of goes out long and flat like that rather than like this for Atlantic salmon. And you hope to get some red tipped ones. They've been killing the birds when they're young too young and they don't get those red tips. But the way they, they you know, they're out of Southeast Asia and China and, and uh, that's where they have most of these birds at. And they chop their heads off, hang them and then they put them in a 55 gallon drum and they may be in that drum in a, some warehouse for years before they get shipped to the United States or wherever they're gonna send them. Now, this stem, I probably should flatten. Yeah, this is the part that I have the most trouble with putting the topping on. It wants to roll on me or yeah. go to one side or the other. And I got a pair of I did have <laughs> well I'll tell you what by by trimming off the edges and leaving those stubs even before that you do that trimming you can take a take a pair of forceps that are flat and you come in right on top like this and squeeze and then you reverse it and do it from the other side. You know, jaws when they come together are like this. And they're tight on here and looser up there when you crush something. So by going to the other side, you'll get it much flatter. And then uh, what I sometimes will do is I will put the there and then I'll bend the stem so that it'll have a pre tie-in position located. Now, knowing that this stem is probably going to rotate on me, I'll go up and I'll do two wraps. Yeah. And sometimes you will try to I wish it hadn't have done that. It's almost on just right straight. <laughs> but it's way too long on the back here. And that's where sometimes you can adjust. Now, when you do hold on to things and adjust them, you're smart to hold on to your bobbin while you do that. Okay, now see how it came over to this side, but now there's the tie-in spot located a little better. And where you usually have trouble with getting these on 
is, it's a round stem. And unless you flatten it, it will want to roll on you. Yeah, it's, it's tough. <laughs> I've got such a angle it's trying to come down on. Now that's not, not the best, but looking down on it from the top, yeah, it looks great. That one, you know, it's it's down across the cent the center here looking at it from the top and looking at it from the side it's these two meet it is compressing that wing a little bit more and that's where it's sometimes going through and you can adjust the angle of some of these by putting your thumbnail on it and pulling and then it puts a it puts it more like that rather than like that Okay. Now, there's another thing that can be done to fancy this up. And that is to put uh, horns on. And I don't know if Ted Berkeley's on or not, but he asked me a question, how do you tie on these so that the yellow doesn't show. Well, there's a reason why this feather has a blue side and a yellow. And that's the one that's called for because they want the yellow. If you want it blue, you go to a different macaw that has a solid blue, which is the, I think the military one, it's more expensive, but um, It's how you mount this on by, because it's a T-shaped, it's a, it's a feather that's got a T-shape on it. So looking here, you know, it's, 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 it's a weird shaped. And whenever you try it on and you don't hold it right, it'll roll on you. But again, using these fingers helps. You get it on there and press with these fingers it's held on there tight. You hold on with these fingers, they don't meet as flat. So uh, that so, would be the way to, to finish out that fly. And um, I tied another one. You're talking about holding the, the materials with your thumb and your middle finger, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that works a little bit better because uh, you can put pressure on it and it holds it flat. I'm trying to find where, I tied another one of these. Um, James, we're probably going to have to yeah, finish I, off the head. Yeah, well, the head, when you finish it, you would simply uh, do enough cutting the fibers back here. I'm not doing a good job of the head here because I'm only, remember, I would have another side of this thing and normally right. I would finish the fly off, but simply whip finishing it. Yeah. 
And what do you coat your heads with? Well, I'll either, now you saw me pull that and it, in a, in a, the broke. You gotta be careful doing that because if you pull, pull quick, it breaks at this point. If you pull that slow and it breaks, quite often it breaks up here and then the head unravels. So um, usually you don't want it to break. I'm trying to get in here and cut so you can see without. There you go. There's a stub there, but usually I would use uh, two to three coats of Salir or Sally Hansen's works. Okay. You know, but this is where that's a fairly large needle. But if you go to a smaller needle, you can control where you put that glue a lot better. Now, when I tie off a head, especially on trout flies, I try to do two sets of three whip finishes. And if you get too much glue on, With real thin stuff, what you will find is the first, um, the first glue kind of, when it dries, you'll see, you'll see the wraps. Let it completely dry and then do the second coat. And then it should be pretty smooth. If it isn't, then you need to go and do a third coat. Now the Salir, you can buy it in, in uh, black. You're talking about the Solaris, the, uh, the UV? Well, it's blue. not Solaris. No, this is Salir. Salir, -E oh, okay. -R -E. And it is a, uh, that it's a glue that's, you get it out of France. Okay. But it is one that the Atlantic salmon tires like because it's a good glue glossy head and it's very thin so right. it penetrates into the fibers to hold that head because you got a lot of materials up front there quite often right now uh, let's see here well jim we're gonna have to probably wrap yeah. it up here yeah, and I didn't know if people had questions or yeah, we've been we've been doing the questions all along. Okay. And, uh, matter of fact, you, I'm looking at a, a lot of them. I would say over fifty percent of them were all real positive comments on your tying instruction. You did okay. a great job, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think a, a lot of people have recognized. Uh, matter of fact, I'm seeing even more comments. Uh, he said, can you hold up a can of that Salir? It was one. Here's the fly I did earlier today. Okay. Finished. Somebody yeah. asked if you could uh, show the can of Salir. Well, I don't know if I, I didn't bring one. But how, how, do you spell, how do you spell it? C-E-L-I-R-E. -E. Okay. Okay. Now, Good. here's Sally Hansen's bottle. Okay, right, if, you, if, you, right. if you had gray glass and, or brown glass instead of white glass and a yellow label that said Salir on it, black top, not quite okay. as tall as that, that's what the bottle of Salir will look like. Okay. It is not that there, there's a guy up in Canada that sells it and I every once in a Rich used to uh, when he had Creekside Fly Shop. And I don't know if the Creekside Fly Shop up in uh, up in Issaquah handles it or not. You know, but it's it's not easy to get because okay. of the shipping. 
has to come land, you know, over right. land. Yep, they can't airship it. Or by boat. <laughs> but Jim, I appreciate you uh, spend time with us tonight and great instruction and uh, you got some very great comments and we had about uh, 62 participants. Well, that's so thank, good. Go I want to thank everybody and uh, uh, next week we're going to have uh, a deer hair demonstration and uh, uh, a good buddy of mine is uh, going to, hold on a second, uh, Mike George and uh, he's going to be our demonstrator next week. So see everybody next week. Same time. Yep. And thanks for watching. <laughs>